Well, I want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. Well, as custom, we have two objectives. First, to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And secondly, to encourage each other in the Lord. We have confidence that God will accomplish these both of these objectives in us this evening. And in fact, he, the history so far, each night he have accomplished it. And just the fact that all of us are here together, it's clear evidence that God is on his way to accomplish this in us. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask if you just bow your head with me as we ask God to guide our thoughts and our words and everything that we will do. Bow your head with me, please. Heavenly Father and our God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come before you and I ask that you would be with us in a special way at this point. That whatever we may say, whatever we may do, will be to your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, for me, it's one of our highest highest evening when we have Dr. Hannah with us. Whenever he share with us, it really refreshes me, refresh my soul. I remember when we first started this show, those weeks were so stressful in terms of the uncertainty of the COVID-19. Never really know what's going on and how it really infect us. And when he finished that even program, it left uh, some of the burden of me personally, and I had testimony of other people that express the same. So, Dr. Anna, it is truly, truly, truly an honor to have you here with us this evening. Good to be with you. Now, in our presentation for the last few weeks, we've been looking at the concept of God's sanctuary, and we're going to pick up with that again today. And so here is our slide presentation, the sanctuary message. And I have fine tuned the subtitle that you can see on your screen. How many rooms are in God's house? How many rooms are in God's house? And that helps us to emphasize the main point of my presentation, which is that we need a bigger uh, vision a bigger imagination, a bigger understanding of all that is involved in the sanctuary message. We must avoid the temptation of thinking about the sanctuary message as if it is a small message. It's not a small message, it's a large message. It has a broad scope. And the scope of this message, as we have discovered over the past few weeks, is as broad as the universe. The entire universe created by God was created to be a dwelling place for himself and his intelligent creatures, angels, humans, and maybe even other kinds of intelligent beings that we don't know anything about. The universe was created to be the context, the place where God would interact with his creatures. And so the whole thing is his sanctuary. And so that helps us reflect a little bit more broadly and largely about the question. You know the answer Jesus gave to that question, don't you? When he was about to leave his disciples, he says, in my father's house are many mansions, many mansions, many rooms. So God's sanctuary, God's house, is a place where we're going to live with him, where we're going to dwell with him. And in fact, this is the central message of the sanctuary that we have been reviewing over the past few weeks. We're not going to take a long time going through what we covered before, because by now you've gotten the point, but I'm just reminding you of the main point of the message. And so we see that even on earth, there are different dimensions of the sanctuary message, four different dimensions. And God had the Israelites build a place called the sanctuary, but they also referred to their capital city, Jerusalem, as God's sanctuary. And the entire land of Palestine was called the Holy Land because God dwelt there with his people. And the entire earth was created to be 
a dwelling place for God and his people. God's kingdom is intended to cover the whole earth. And there you see the picture of the tabernacle within the camp of Israel. And here's the temple within Jerusalem, which is also the holy city because God dwells there. And then the whole planet is intended to be a place where God would live with his people. And the same four levels of sanctuary meaning are present when we look at the heavenly dimension of the sanctuary. Uh, Jesus ministers in the sanctuary in heaven. That sanctuary was not built by humans, but built by God himself, according to Hebrews 8 verse 2. And heaven itself is referred to as God's tabernacle or God's dwelling place. Uh, the heavenly Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven, is referred to as God's tabernacle or dwelling place. And the entire universe, as we said already, is intended to be a sanctuary, a holy mountain, a place where God dwells with his created being. And there we have a picture of the new Jerusalem, and a picture of the whole universe, which is the place God created for interaction between himself and his creatures. Then finally, we looked at the fact that the sanctuary message is not just about holy places, but it's also about holy people. Because God is a sanctuary for his people. God is a holy person. In fact, there are three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are a sanctuary for the people of God. And God's people, God's church, is a sanctuary in which he dwells. And each of us as individual Christians is a sanctuary in which God desires to dwell through the Holy Spirit. So we really haven't fully understood the scope of the sanctuary message if we leave out the holy persons who are also holy places where God wants to dwell. God wants to live in us and he wants us to live in right relationship with him. And this is the point of the sanctuary message. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, drives home this point. God dwells with us. God tabernacles with us in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, last week, we looked at this picture of the sanctuary, the courtyard, sometimes referred to as the outer court, and then the tabernacle with two apartments in it and the different pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. And we study these uh, parts of the sanctuary building and the furniture in the sanctuary in order to discover the message of the sanctuary. And of course, the bottom line of the message is God wants to dwell with his people. God wants to break down the separation between him and his people. And that's what the message of the sanctuary is all about. So last week, we looked at how God did that through Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, came down to the earth to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And in doing this, he fulfilled the symbolism of the altar of burnt offering in the outer court. And when he began his ministry, he fulfilled the symbolism of the laver, where the priests did their washing, which is a symbol of baptism. When Jesus was baptized by John, he fulfilled the sanctuary ministry at the laver, where the priest would wash himself in preparation for ministry. And then on the cross of Calvary, he fulfilled the symbolism of the altar of burnt offering, where the sacrifice was killed and the blood was sprinkled and the sacrifice was burnt on the altar of burnt offering. All of this was fulfilled by Jesus Christ when he came down from heaven to earth. He left the inner holy places of heaven and came out into the outer court of God's sanctuary, which included the earth. And there he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. So this Christ-centered way of interpreting the sanctuary message helps us to see the close connection between heaven and earth. So that even though heaven and earth is far away, as far as our physical understanding of where heaven is, is concerned, yet as far as God's ability to travel from heaven to earth, it's not far at all. 
God is omnipotent, omnipresent, all powerful, and he can simply step out of heaven into earth. For God is just as simple as stepping out of his house into his yard. Because where we are on earth is near to God because of his divine ability to travel over great distances. And so God just steps out of his holy places in heaven and steps down to earth, which is regarded as the outer court of the heavenly sanctuary, where Jesus offers himself as a sacrifice for sin. There you have a picture of the priest offering a lamb who is the representative of Jesus in the outer court of the sanctuary. So this symbolizes the ministry of Christ for us on planet earth which is the ministry that takes place in the outer court of the sanctuary, which means that earth itself is part of the sanctuary context. When Christ came to earth, he came into the outer court of the sanctuary. Then we looked at the symbolism inside the sanctuary and saw that even with regard to the symbols that are inside the building of the sanctuary, there's a close connection with what happens on earth. So we have now on the screen the seven golden candlesticks, which provided light in the first apartment of the sanctuary. And in the book of Revelation, we learn that those seven golden candlesticks represent the seven churches. And so even though the first apartment is in heaven, what happens in that first apartment is closely connected to what's happening on earth as Jesus ministers to the seven churches which exist on the planet earth. So again, teaching us the close connection between earth and heaven. And in a very real sense, each Christian is a candlestick. Each Christian has a light, and we ought to keep our lamps trimmed and burning and let our lights so shine before men so they may see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. So there's a close connection between heaven and earth that's communicated in the symbolism of the sanctuary. Same thing with the table of showbread, uh, which represents Jesus, the bread of life, who came down from heaven to the earth. John chapter 6 and verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. So the symbolism of the table of showbread in the heavenly sanctuary communicates again God's plan and ministry toward planet earth, toward cleaning up the sanctuary on planet earth. We talked about the altar of incense and the golden censer and the incense ascending from these two pieces of furniture represents the prayers of the saints that are received in heaven through the ministry of, of the Holy Spirit and are sanctified by the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. Because of Jesus, our prayers can be heard in heaven. And therefore, we have access not only to the outer court, which is where we are, because Jesus came down to where we are, into the outer court, to offer himself as a sacrifice, but we have access to the holy place, but we also have access to the most holy place, because we have an anchor that goes in through the veil, into the very presence of God, where Jesus is interceding and ministering on our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. So the symbolism of the sanctuary, is all about teaching us that God is not far away from us. He is close to us. He can step out of his sanctuary into the earth to save us. And by faith, we can step into the heavenly sanctuary and experience the benefits of the ministry of our high priest who is in heaven. So there's a close connection between heaven and earth. God is with us and he's trying to teach us this through the sanctuary message. Then last week we got into the study of Daniel 8, 13 and 14. We're going to pick up from there again today. Daniel 8, 13 and 14. How long will be the vision concerning the daily sacrifices? That phrase, daily sacrifices, is referring to the sanctuary ministry. Every day in the earthly sanctuary of the Israelite nation, there were sacrifices offered every day. And how long will be the transgression of desolation? That's the defiling of God's sanctuary, the interruption of the daily sacrifice. When the Assyrians 
attacked the Israelites, they interrupted their sanctuary ministry. When the Babylonians attacked the Israelites, they interrupted the sanctuary ministry. Um, when the Romans attacked uh, Jerusalem in AD 70, this was the abomination of desolation, again, in the holy place, interrupting the physical sanctuary ministry in ancient Israel. And so Daniel is one of the captives in Babylon, and he is studying the prophecies, and he discovers in the prophecy that God has promised that he will restore the sanctuary. He will send Israel back into the promised land and give them additional time to accomplish his purpose through them as a nation. And Daniel is saying, how long, how long will it be until the sanctuary is cleansed? How long are you going to allow your sanctuary to be defiled? How long will you allow the host to be trampled underfoot? Uh, referring to the people of God as the host. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So here we have this concept of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And interestingly, this cleansing of the sanctuary is connected with the idea of a time period, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And here is a chart that sums up the 2,300 days and what we learn about the 2,300 days by reading Daniel chapter 9. You asked a question about that last week, uh, Pastor Barnaby, and I said we'd get into it a little bit more this yeah. week. Look a little bit more closely at Daniel 9 and how we make the calculations mm -hmm. of the events that take place during the 2,000 300 years. And so here is a chart that summarizes it in a very plain way that you can, you can see. And uh, by the way, Pastor Barnaby, uh, I am willing to share this PowerPoint with you so that you can share it with other members of the ministry there too, uh, so that you can have access to it and, and use it as you see fit. Sure. I appreciate that, Dr. Anna. Thank you. Yeah. So here is the outline of the 2,300 days. Now, I want you to, to notice a couple of things that we need to pay attention to with regard to this time prophecy. Very often when we study the prophecy, we focus only on 1844 and the fact that judgment began in a special way in 1844. But I want you to note the fact that God is always judge over the earth, even before 1844. So notice that in 457 BC, God raised up the Medo-Persian kingdom to defeat the Babylonian kingdom and prepare the way for 457 BC so that the Israelites could go back and restore their temple. They could clean up the temple rebuild the city of Jerusalem, rebuild their temple. This was what 457 BC is all about. And sometimes we forget that when we study the 2,200 day prophecy. There was a rebuilding of the physical sanctuary on earth in 457 BC. And there is another cleansing of the sanctuary in 1844 at the end of the 2,200 days. So not only do we have a cleansing of the sanctuary at the end, we also have a cleansing of the sanctuary at the beginning. So this period of time begins with a cleansing of the sanctuary on earth. And it ends with the beginning of the announcing of the message about a cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. So when we focus on the end of the 2,300 days, we must not overlook the parallelism between the end and the beginning of the 2,300 days. So Israel had apostatized from God. They had defiled their worship. They were punished by the Babylonian invasion. Their temple was destroyed. Many of their citizens were taken captive into the nation of Babylon. And for 70 years, the temple services were interrupted. It's in that context that Daniel is confessing his sins and confessing the sins of his people. 
and praying for the sanctuary to be cleansed. And God assures him that at the end of the 70 years of uh, captivity, God's people would go back to Palestine, they would rebuild their city, and, and they would rebuild their temple, and they would begin again the worship of God in Palestine, in the Holy Land, in the city, in the sanctuary. And this all began to be fulfilled in 457 BC. So in a sense, God has always been judge over the earth. He judged his people Israel through the Babylonian captivity, and he judged that the time was right to let them go back to Palestine so that they could have another period of probation in order to fulfill God's purpose through the nation of Israel. So God has different dimensions of judgment that happen at different times in human history. And you see one dimension of judgment here uh, right at the beginning of the 2,300 days uh, that is mentioned in Daniel 8, 14. Then you have another a judgment event in uh, the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary. Those of you who are Bible students will know that just before he went to Calvary, Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. And now will the rulers of darkness be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. And so the crucifixion of Christ is also a judgment event. And in the last week of the probationary time given to ancient Israel, Jesus came to preach the gospel first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when they rejected him and crucified him, uh, he said to them, now your house is left unto you desolate. And he predicted the destruction of Jerusalem that would take place in AD 70. So we have another time of judgment here in the midst of this 2,300 days that take place after the nation of Israel rejected Jesus as their savior. And so beginning in 457 BC, we have 70 weeks, as you can see on the chart. That's that round line on the left side of the chart, round blue line. 70 weeks, which adds up to 490 days, which since one day represents a year in prophecy is 490 years. That's the time from the rebuilding of the city after the judgment of the Babylonians to the time when they rejected Christ and rejected the preaching of the gospel with the stoning of Stephen in AD 34, which prepared the way for the judgment at the hand of the Roman armies who would come in in AD 70 and destroy again the city of Jerusalem, destroy again the temple, bring again to an end the services of the earthly sanctuary uh, through the abomination of the Roman armies that would come in. And then that leaves us with 1810 years. That's the light blue line that goes from AD 34 to 1844. And the prediction of this prophecy is that there would be another judgment connected with another cleansing of the sanctuary in 1844. Now, the interesting question that arises here now for Bible students is, what sanctuary is this that is to be cleansed in 1844? Because the earthly sanctuary of the Jews in the earthly Jerusalem has never been rebuilt since AD 70 and the Babel and the Roman soldiers destroyed it in AD 70. Uh, the, the Jerusalem temple has never been rebuilt on planet earth and so when 1844 came along the earthly Jerusalem and the earthly sanctuary in Jerusalem was not cleansed and set right. So has God's promise failed when he predicted that after 2,200 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed? No, God's promise has not failed because this promise is not about the cleansing of the 
physical temple in Israel. But this promise is about the cleansing of the spiritual temple of God, which is his church and also the sanctuary and temple in heaven. And so it is a heavenly sanctuary and a spiritual understanding of the sanctuary message that is anticipated in this prophecy that says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. All right, we're going to slip away from this chart for a while now. Uh, we may have more questions about that in the question and answer session. But let's just move on and look a little bit at Daniel 9, 23 and 24, which gives us the information that I just quickly summarized for you there when we were looking at the chart. So let's look at the text now to support what we've just been talking about. So Daniel 9, 23 and 24, uh, the angel says to Daniel, consider the matter and understand the vision. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Notice the angel is speaking to Daniel and Daniel is an Israelite. So God is speaking to Daniel about his own people, the nation of Israel, and his own holy city, which was Jerusalem in Palestine. He says, I'm going to give you 70 weeks so that you can put an end to transgression. You can make an end of your sins. You can make reconciliation for iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So this is the 70 weeks we just looked at in the first half of this chart. 490 years is 70 weeks. Each week has seven days. So 70 times seven equals 490. And if a day equals a year, that's 490 years. So God gives to national Israel a period of probation. And during that period of probation, he wanted to work with his people to accomplish the cleansing of the sanctuary through the ministry of national Israel. And that's why, as the time was running out for Israel, Jesus himself came to the earth and began his ministry among the Israelites, seeking to lead them into this experience of the cleansing of the sanctuary that is communicated here in this text. 70 weeks given to your people and for your holy city to make an end of transgression, to make an end of sins, and to reconcile and anoint the most holy sanctuary of God. Of course, uh, Jesus did his part by shedding his blood for the remission of sins, to make an end of sins. But to a large extent, the people of Israel rejected this message of salvation through Jesus. And so many of them, most of them, uh, refused to participate in God's plan and purpose through Christ for bringing in everlasting righteousness. They rejected Christ. They rejected the message of the Christian church. They stoned Stephen to death in AD 34. And then in AD 70, the city and the sanctuary on earth was destroyed uh, one more time. And as we pointed out, it has not, the city has been rebuilt, but the sanctuary, the temple of Israel in the city of Jerusalem has never been rebuilt. So if you go to, to Israel right now, as a tourist, you will notice that on the spot, on the holy ground, where the temple is supposed to be, you know what they have right now? A mosque for the worship of the Muslims on the holy ground of the sanctuary in Israel. And so this prophecy has not been fulfilled on a physical level in the nation of Israel but it has been fulfilled spiritually through Jesus Christ who offered his blood for the remission of sin and to anoint and cleanse the sanctuary. And then, of course, Jesus has ascended into heaven to minister in the heavenly sanctuary to bring to a fulfillment the promises of God in a spiritual sense. Verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 
unto the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks, which adds up to 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, and the walls even in troublous times. And so this text refers to the beginning of the, the prophecy. You see, from the time of 457, God would assist his people to go back and rebuild the city, and then there would be this period of weeks that would lead up to the Messiah. You see that there in the green line, 69 weeks, 69 times seven equals 483, which brings us up to the baptism of Christ and the beginning of his earthly ministry, his public earthly ministry during the last three years of his life leading up to his crucifixion in the midst of the week uh, in AD 31. So all of that is a fulfillment of what is written in Daniel 9.25. After 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. That's the crucifixion of Christ, not for himself. And then the people of the prince who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's a prediction about the Roman army that would come and destroy the city and the sanctuary after the death of Christ. So there would be an end of the Jewish independence. There would be a, a destruction of their city, a destruction of their temple, and the wars and desolations will take place. But before that would happen, Jesus himself would be cut off. When would he be cut off? In the middle of the week. He would bring an end to the sacrifice and the offerings. So that's what we have on the chart there, the cross in the middle of the week. Jesus died bringing an end to the physical sacrifices of lambs and goats and cows in a physical temple on earth because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he brings to an end that system through his spiritual perfect sacrifice on Calvary. And because of that, that prepared the way for bringing an end to all their ritual services, which took place in AD 70, when the Romans came in and destroyed their temple. So that literally the sacrifices ended in AD 70. But spiritually, Jesus had already brought an end to them because he was the ultimate sacrifice. Now that the Lamb of God has come, who takes away the sin of the world, there's no more need for offering lambs for sacrifices in a physical sanctuary in Palestine. That has come to an end. All right. So that covers the part of the chart that leads up to the crucifixion of Christ, the, the stoning of Stephen, the AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem. But then the rest of the chart brings us now to the end of the 2,300 days in 1844 the end of the 2,200 days in 1844, uh, at the time of the Advent Awakening, which was followed soon thereafter by the rise of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to preach the three angels' messages about the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Yes, the earthly sanctuary in Israel is no more, but the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus ministers in heaven is very busy. Jesus is up in heaven doing ministry in heaven on our behalf. And this is the message that began to be announced through the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which came on the scene of history during the period ushered in by the Advent Awakening message of the 1840s. So this brings us to this statement by Ellen White that I shared with you a few weeks ago. Since the passing of 1844, since the end of the 2,300 days, we are living in the great antitypical day of atonement. Jesus is now in the heavenly sanctuary, making reconciliation for the sins of his people. And the judgment of the righteous dead has been going on since 1844. Now that's a significant point that we must not forget as Seventh-day Adventists as we think about the judgment message that we proclaim. When Jesus began his ministry in 1844 of judgment, 
he began his ministry with the judgment of the righteous dead. And at some point, he will transition to the judgment of those who are living. But the judgment that began in 1844 had to do with the judgment of the dead. How soon the cases of the living will come into the review before this judgment, before this tribunal, we do not know. There are a lot of Adventists, even today, who are trying to calculate and set dates as to when the judgment of the living will begin. But we do not know when it will begin. It, it could have begun already. It may yet begin in the future. We just don't know exactly when it will begin. It has not been revealed to us. How soon the cases of the living will come into review before this tribunal, we do not know. But we do know that we are living in the closing scenes of Earth's history, standing, as it were, on the very borders of the eternal world. So that's an interesting summary statement by Ellen White of the Adventist understanding of the judgment that's been going on since 1844, which began with a judgment of the righteous dead but will one day transition into a judgment of the righteous who are still alive. And that's the transition that we need to be thinking about as we think of what's going on now in terms of Christ's ministry in heaven. Now, as we try to think about that, here are some Bible texts that I think we should remember. And I shared some of these with you before, but let's look at them a little bit more closely again today. I call this first, slide, God's usual judgment policy. And the next slide coming up will be God's unusual judgment policy. So we need to know the distinction between these two. And this distinction is exactly what Ellen White is talking about here when she says, since 1844, judgment has been going on in relationship to those who are dead, but at some point, judgment will transition to the review of the cases of those who are living. That distinction right there is the distinction I have in mind when I talk about the difference between God's usual judgment policy and God's extraordinary, unusual judgment policy. So let's look first at his usual judgment policy. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. That's God's usual process for judgment. He delays the judgment until after our death. And that's why the judgment in 1844 begins with the cases of those who are dead. Do you see the connection? Uh, God begins the cases with those who are dead because that's his usual judgment procedure to judge after a person has died. So a very important text to think about is Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now, of course, we already looked at Daniel 8, 14. For unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This cleansing of the sanctuary points to a work of judgment. But notice that Jesus' ministry of cleansing the sanctuary in heaven is connected closely with what Jesus is ministering through his church on earth. Because at the end of the 2000 days, we have the time of the end, which involves the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven, but it also involves the time of the end during which God's church will preach a message concerning the cleansing of the sanctuary on earth. And that's referred to in Daniel 12, verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, until the time of the end. What's that time of the end? The time after the 2,300 days. The time in which we are now living is the time of the end. But you, Daniel, shut up those words, seal the book, until the time of the end. What will happen in the time of the end? What will be happening on earth while Jesus is cleansing his sanctuary in heaven? Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. 
And my message to you this evening is that we as Seventh-day Adventists, we as Final Shout Ministry, Pastor Owen, we are the ones who are to fulfill this text, Daniel 12, verse 4. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. Amen. It's, it's the knowledge of the good news of the gospel. It's the knowledge of the judgment hour that we are to run to and fro in the earth, proclaiming while Jesus, our high priest, is doing his ministry in heaven, we who are priests with him through his sacrifice on Calvary are to be doing his ministry on earth by running to and fro on earth to proclaim the message that the hour of God's judgment is come. We call it the three angels' messages. So again, as you see, is my tendency in my teaching I want to affirm what we have always taught about Christ cleansing the sanctuary in heaven. But I also want to connect it with what we have sometimes neglected to teach. And that is that there is a ministry on earth that must proceed at the same time as Jesus is cleansing the sanctuary in heaven. We are to be going to and fro in the earth, announcing to the world this judgment hour message. And that's exactly what's predicted uh, about what is to happen at the end of the 2,300 days when God is cleansing the sanctuary in heaven, God's people are cooperating with him by proclaiming the message of the cleansing of the sanctuary on earth. Why is this important? Second Peter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering to us with not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So even though the hour of God's judgment has come since 1844, God is still hoping that people will repent of their sins as we preach the three angels' messages so that they can be part of the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. Our preaching of the gospel on earth is our way of cooperating with Jesus as he cleansed the sanctuary in heaven. That's the point we want to make. Again, the close connection between what's happening in heaven and what ought to be happening on earth. That's why God begins the judgment in heaven with his usual judgment policy, which is to wait until people die before he judges them. But that means that probation is still open and that we can still preach the gospel so that many more can repent and receive Christ into their hearts, receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit, so that the cleansing on earth will be taking place at the same time as the cleansing in heaven through the ministry of Christ is taking place. So I hope you, you're seeing the connection there. God is long-suffering, so he continues his usual judgment policy of waiting until people have died in order to judge them, and so as long as people are alive, we, there is hope. And we ought to be rushing to and fro in the earth to preach the gospel, to preach the three angels' messages to them so that we can do our part in cooperating with Christ in the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. Now, when our work is done, when we have preached the gospel into all the world and everyone has made a decision for or against Christ, when an entire generation of people have become hardened in sin and rebellion against the truth of the gospel, or settled into their repentance and conversion in their relationship with Jesus Christ, then God will shift gears into his unusual judgment policy, which is to judge people while they're alive. Why does God shift? his policy in the last moment of time because delaying to judge the living in the final generation will not result in more people repenting because they have already hardened themselves in their sins and there is no more room for repentance and therefore God brings an end to his usual judgment policy and he judges people while they are alive. It is this unusual judgment policy that's being referred to here in Revelation 22, 
10, 11, and 12. Notice he says here, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. Does that ring a bell in terms of the book of Daniel? Here he's saying, do not seal up the book. In Daniel, he says, shut up the book, seal the book. Do you see the difference? Daniel 12, 4 in the middle of the screen. But you, O Daniel, shut the words up, seal the book until the time of the end, when many will run to and fro, and the knowledge of the truth will increase in the earth. Daniel is told to seal up the book until that time comes. But now things have changed. God says, do not seal up the words of this prophecy, for the time is at hand. Now, why has things changed? The answer is in verse 11 and 12. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. This is not talking about dead people. This is talking about living people. All to be on the right side when this announcement is made. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. We spend a lot of time wondering, when is Jesus going to come? He said he was going to come quickly, but he hadn't come yet. And we wonder, how come he, he hasn't come if he said he was going to come quickly? Well, we haven't paid attention to what he really said. He said, when probation closes, then I will come quickly. Until probation closes, he is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the time is near when probation will close, and he will announce that probation has closed, as is the case in this text in Revelation 20, 10 through 12. When probation is closed, there's no more need to be long-suffering and to delay the coming of Christ. When the sinners have been so hardened in sin that they will no longer be converted by the preaching of the three angels' messages. When the true believers have been settled into the truth so securely that they can never be moved, then probation will be closed. Then this announcement will be made. And then the judgment of the living will have taken place, and then Jesus will come quickly. In fact, Jesus said in another place, as soon as the harvest is complete, he comes immediately and puts in the sickle and reaps the harvest, which is a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So this is God's unusual judgment policy where he judges a final generation who are still alive. Why does he judge them while they're still alive? Is it because he's no longer long-suffering? Not at all. It's because long-suffering doesn't change anything anymore because the righteous are righteous still, and they will not fall away anymore from their righteousness. And the wicked are wicked still, and they will not repent anymore of their sins. And therefore, there's no more point to delaying the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's when the judgment of the living takes place. All right. So we'll stop there again for today and uh, open up for a discussion of these things. And then we'll pick up from here again next time. Thank appreciate, you very much. I appreciate that, Ghana. Thank you very much. I, I have several questions, and I'm sure at some point the audience will have question as well. My, my first question is, it is clear that this message is a message that has to do with prophecy. Mm -hmm. And so that, so then you also, you make a, con, you make a connection to, to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Yes. Also. Oh, yes. Let's go back to that uh, chart here. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, which is 1844. 
uh, when God begins this final uh, period of judgment, Ellen White says, beginning with the cases of those who are dead, and then thereafter, he will, uh, he will transition to judging those who are still alive. Well, this is the time of the Advent Awakening. This is the time of the Millerite movement. In other words, what Jesus began to do in heaven is closely connected to what's happening in the church on earth. And if you miss anything of the details of what I'm teaching, I don't want you to miss that detail, that the whole point of the cleansing of the sanctuary, the whole point of the sanctuary message is to teach us of the close connection between heaven and earth. We miss the point when we separate what Jesus is doing in heaven from what Jesus is doing on earth through his church. So we're living in the period of time since 1844. We need to look at what Jesus is doing on earth since 1844. And that's where the Millerite movement comes in. And that's where the Seventh-day Adventist church comes in, which continues the work of the Advent awakening that happened in the 1840s preaching a special message of the hour of God's judgment on earth. We preach that message on earth, even though the judgment is happening in heaven. And so we should recognize that Jesus doing something unique and new in heaven is connected with Jesus doing something unique and new on earth. And that unique and new thing he's doing on earth or aiming to do on earth has to do with his church proclaiming a unique message about the judgment hour in the time of the end, which is indicated by the end of the 2,200 day prophecy. We could talk more about that, but that's the short answer. Uh, I appreciate it. So yeah. my second question then, there are many different Christian religion on earth what made the Adventist church so unique in, one of, in, in, in respect to what you just said? Yeah, this is a very important question, Pastor Owen. Very, very important question. And my answer is that God is calling all Christians from all denominations to be part of this worldwide ministry of preaching the three angels' messages at this time. One of the biggest mistakes we could make is thinking that he called us because we were more righteous than the others. That's exactly the mistake that Israel made, thinking that God called them because they were a more righteous nation than the other nation. No, God didn't call us because he's not interested in the others. God is calling every Christian. In fact, God is calling every human being to, to proclaim this message and to receive this message and to repent in the light of this message. So we must present this message with humility. We must not present this message with pride and condescension toward other Christians. Uh, we have discovered the truth about what Jesus is calling Christians to do. And when we preach, we must be inviting the Baptists to join us in preaching about the hour of God's judgment. We must invite the Pentecostals to join us, invite the Catholics to join us. It's not about us being especially righteous people, therefore God gave us the message. God's message is for the whole world. We are to go to and fro into the whole world, sharing this message with others and inviting them to be a part of it. And we need to do that in a very humble way because the fact that you're a Seventh-day Adventist doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be part of those who are cleansed in the judgment. There will be many Seventh-day Adventists who will be among those of whom Jesus will say, he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And that they're Adventists. And still in the judgment, they are defined as filthy. He who is uh, unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. Many Adventists are going to be in that group. And many non-Adventists may end up being in the group who hear Jesus say, he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. So it's really not about just being a member of a church. It's about, do you really have Jesus in your heart? Do you really, are you really born again? Are you a new creature in Christ Jesus? 
Is the Holy Spirit inspiring you to understand the signs of the times and to preach the message for these times? And uh, when the Jews did not fulfill God's purpose for them, uh, the gospel went to the Gentiles. And if the Adventists were not to fulfill God's purpose for them, God will raise up non-Adventists to preach the message. It's really not about denominational specialness. It's about the message. And I believe Adventists will receive this message and will proclaim it. I don't believe hope is lost for our church, but only those who receive it and proclaim it in the power of the Spirit with a Christ-centered focus. Only those are the true Adventists. It's not enough just to be an Adventist. You have to actually be part of this spiritual movement that is on earth fulfilling the purpose of God in cooperating on earth with what Jesus is doing in heaven. And if he, if he can't get the cooperation from us as Adventists, he'll raise up Catholics to preach it. He'll raise up Baptists to preach it. He'll raise up Pentecostals to preach it. So let's not, uh, take, let not take for granted the fact that we are Seventh-day Adventists. Let's actually open our hearts to the leading of the Spirit so that someone else wouldn't be brought in by God to take our place when we are found to be unfaithful stewards of the message that has been given to us. I hope that helps. Two questions, and when I ask two questions, I will ask the audience to come in if they do have a question. Um, my first question, how would you define Adventists in terms of the entire world and Christ's second coming? Mm -hmm. Yeah, from the point of view of God's sanctuary, the true Adventist is the one who is truly converted. The true Adventist is not the one who comes to church on Saturday. The true Adventist is the one who is tru truly converted. You can't be truly converted without being an Adventist. Anyone who is truly converted automatically becomes an Adventist because the new heart that has been given to them through conversion desires the second coming of Jesus Christ. The new heart that is given to them in conversion desires to go out and share their faith with others. The new heart that's given to us desires to understand better the teaching of scripture. And so if we're true Adventists, we'll be growing in grace. We'll be growing in our ministry to others. We'll be desiring the second coming of Jesus Christ. And there are people who are true Adventists in that spiritual sense, who have not yet had an opportunity to hear the Advent message because we've been too lazy to share it with them. But they're still true Christians. They're just waiting for us to come and share the message with them. And we, we make a big mistake if we think that they're not true Christians because they're not Adventists. Some of them are not Adventists because we haven't shared our faith with them yet, but they are true believers. So from God's perspective in the heavenly sanctuary, he doesn't decide who is a true believer based on which church you're part of. He decides who is a true believer based on his view into the hearts of men and women. You know, let me illustrate this a certain way. I, I have in my wallet a, a worker's credential that identifies me as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Okay? So if the police stops me, I can pull out my credential and show him that I'm a pastor working for the Adventist church. Uh, here in Bern Springs, I can show him my ID card that says I work at Andrews University. And the police may give me a certain respect because I have that card. And that's a wonderful thing. But when Jesus comes the second time, it's not gonna be any good for me to pull out my ID card that shows that I work at Andrews University and start waving it <laughs> and say, see me here. I work at Andrews University, I'm ready to go out. That's not gonna help me at all because Jesus is not looking at an ID card in my wallet. He's looking straight into my heart. Am I a true Adventist? And if I'm not a true Adventist on the inside, even though I work at Andrews University and I'm paid by the Holy Tithe in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, when the saints are caught up to heaven, I'll stay grounded on earth because I'm not a true Adventist. So we need to examine ourselves as Seventh-day Adventists, whether we are really in Christ, whether we are really allowing him to cleanse the sanctuary of our hearts on earth, 
while he is cleansing his sanctuary in heaven. Because unless we're connected with heaven in that way, we're not true Adventists. Follow-up question. My follow-up question to, to you then, what is, the mission, what is the message that we're called to preach in summary? Yeah. Well, for the purpose of this series of studies, the message could be summarized in terms of the sanctuary message. You know, if we were preaching on a different topic, we could say the message was the Sabbath message. Uh, we could say the message is the message of health reform. You know, there are all kinds of different facets to the message. But in terms of the emphasis we're, we're focusing on for this series, we could sum up the message and say it's the message of the sanctuary, the message of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Uh, this is a significant central feature of the message that we are called to teach. But we have to ask ourselves sometimes, do we ourselves understand this message that we say we are called to preach and to share? And I think often we ourselves don't understand it. And that's why I warn about the danger of being a Seventh-day Adventist and yet really not being part of this message. You know, so many, I know Adventist pastors who are not sure what the significance of the sanctuary message is. I know Adventist members who are not sure what the significance of the sanctuary message is. They just know Adventists have a sanctuary message. But what's the punchline of it? What's the bottom line of it? We don't know, some of us. And that's why I'm emphasizing this particular message at this time and saying, let's get the bottom line of this message, which is that the relationship between heaven and earth is very close. The sanctuary message is that God wants to dwell with us. And therefore, the cleansing of the sanctuary is not just about something that happens in heaven, it's also about something that happens on earth. And my personal relationship with Jesus plugs me in through that anchor that goes into the holy place in heaven. My relationship with Jesus by faith, love and hope plugs me into heaven so that I can be connected with heaven so that what happens in heaven is paralleled with what's happening on earth in my life. If I don't understand that, I don't really understand the sanctuary message. So we need a deeper understanding of the sanctuary message so we can preach it in a more Christ-centered, biblical way, relevant <laughs> to the questions that people ask in the world. They have gone back to that point, you see? Uh, if not, our sanctuary message comes just a kind of a legalism. And we fight over what's not the main point. You know, we fight over things like, is there really a sanctuary in heaven? Or how many rooms are in the sanctuary in heaven? You know? Uh, and we miss the main spiritual point of the sanctuary message, which is God wants to clean up his people on earth and use them to announce the message of the sanctuary in terms of what he's doing in heaven, because there's a close connection with what he's doing in heaven and what he's doing on earth. To illustrate it again, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, don't even start preaching until you receive the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus ascended into heaven and from heaven, he poured down upon them the Holy Spirit and empowered them to go out and turn the world upside down. Well, we have to ask ourselves as Adventists, are we counting on our church membership to make us the true people of God? Or are we receiving the Holy Spirit in latter rain proportions so that we can accomplish the purpose for which God has called us to be his people. Remember ancient Israel, remember that 49 years, 490 years given to ancient Israel, here on my chart. God gave them 490 years to accomplish the purpose for which he called them and they failed. And so he had to give the gospel to the Gentiles. And now since 1844, God has been raising up an Advent people to accomplish his work in this last period of earth's history. But we must not make the mistake that the Jews made of thinking that because you're in the organization, you're automatically in. No, God has his people in the organization who are truly cleansing the sanctuary. And God has some people who are not yet in the organization who are truly cleansing the sanctuary because they're plugged in to what Jesus is doing in heaven. It's that personal, dynamic, 
spiritual connection with Christ that makes me the true Adventist, not the identification card that I show to the police when he pulls me over here in Barren Springs. That's not going to help me when it comes to the judgment of God in heaven. might help me out a little bit from the judgment of the police on earth, but when it comes to the judgment in heaven, Jesus is not looking at my ID card. He's not looking at where I'm employed. He's not even looking at which Adventist church I attend. He's looking straight through to the heart and finding out whether I'm really an Adventist or not. And the only way to be a real Adventist is to have the cleansing of the sanctuary happening in the heart while Jesus is cleansing the sanctuary in heaven. Well, you see, I like to talk about this. I can go on forever, but I better slow down and, and uh, see if there's any other questions from the group. Yes, uh, at this time, I want to ask the audience, if you have a question, you please, if you could unmute your microphone or you maybe your phone or your computer and pose a question at this time, please. Hello, I have one. Um, how many different denominations started out? You know, people who were just seeking God um, before there was a quote unquote Seventh day Adventist church? A very interesting question. Of course, prior to 1844, the Christian church had divided already into many, many different denominations. You know, we have the Roman Catholic Church, and then there was the Protestant Reformation at, in the 1600s, and then the Protestants began to splinter up into different organizations. You're familiar with some of them, you know, Baptists, uh, Anglicans, uh, Calvinists, and so on and so forth. So many different divisions took place even prior to 1844. <clears throat> then we had the Advent Awakening with the Millerite movement. And uh, since that time, a number of new uh, movements arose in the United States. You know, we have, we have the Jehovah Witnesses, for example, and, and we have the Seventh-day Baptists. Well, they were around a little before that, but we have a number of recent denominations that have risen uh, in America around the time of the Advent Awakening. And of those groups that arose since 1844, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the one that is fastest growing and most effective in establishing a worldwide organization that has the potential to preach the gospel in all the world. Most of the other groups that arose ended up being relatively small groups that don't have a worldwide reach like we have. Jehovah's Witnesses are also a worldwide movement, but, but um, I think we could argue that the, from a human point of view, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is one of these recent movements that arose in the 1840s and thereafter that has developed a very impressive worldwide organizational institution that has the potential to be used by God to finish the work in all the world. And I do believe that God has raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church because this is the movement that he wants to use to accomplish his purpose in the earth. The danger is that we might assume that because I'm an Adventist, I'm plugged into God. But it's not, it's not about which denomination you're in. It's do you have a living, vital relationship with the Lord Jesus for yourself? Have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Are you born again? That's what really counts. And God has his true people in every organization. There are some truly converted people in the Adventist church. There are some truly converted people in the Catholic church. There's some truly converted people in the Jehovah Witness organization and so on and so forth. There's truly converted people among the Pentecostals. So our true message is to call all God's true people wherever they are to come into a fuller understanding of this sanctuary message that God has given us. The sad thing is, if we ourselves who have been given this message might have turned it into a kind of legalism and it has lost its power and we don't even know how to preach it anymore. Well, I, I kind of got off on a, my hobby horse there again, but I hope my answer was a little helpful. Is there any follow-up to that, Sister Marva? Thank you, that was perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, anyone else? Uh, you're muted, Pastor Owen. Back. 
I have several, but I want to give you the opportunity to do so. Yes, who else would like to come in, uh, make a comment or ask a question? What are your thoughts about the way in which I'm presenting the sanctuary message here? What? I, yes. I just wanted to say, Pastor Hannah, that I am, I am blessed just sitting and listening to the way in which you describe every furniture in the sanctuary above uh, the copy of which was on earth. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I pray that God will continue to bless you. I have learned and I'm still learning. And what I have gained especially is um, the importance of getting connected and staying connected with God. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for what you are doing and what you will continue to do with the help of God. Thank you, Sister Phyllis. I'm, I'm happy that the message is going across. And you notice, uh, I'll comment on that just briefly before we take the next comment or question. Uh, you notice my approach uh, to teaching. I could rush on and give you a lot of new material quickly, but I want to make sure that you understand what I've shared. That's why I keep repeating and, uh, and giving us time to discuss it and dialogue about it so that it's not just information, but that we understand the significance of what we're covering. That's we, right. want to, we want to take time to digest it. And as in the weeks ahead, we'll add more information. As you notice, know, I add a little bit more information each time. But I want us to, to master this message so that you, if somebody wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and says, tell me what Dr. Hannah was teaching you, you can teach it. <laughs> <laughs> By the grace of God. Yes. So, and that only happens if you repeat it over and over again and you double check it and you tie it down. And, and that's why I'm going to share with you the PowerPoints, Pastor Owen, so whoever wants a copy of it can get it through you. Because you have to study it and you have to go over it again and you have to get the point clear in your head. And, and of course, that's just the information side of it. Really, the message is not just to inform us. The message is to transform us. And Amen. So if we just get the message of information and memorize it and say, okay, now I understand it, mm -hmm. that's still not the point. There are some people who, who may not be as intellectually sharp as some of us are, and they may never fully understand all the little intricacies of what I've been presenting. But they're true converted. They're truly converted. They have received the Holy Spirit. They're new creatures in Christ Jesus. And they plug into the power of the sanctuary message even without understanding all the details. That's what Jesus is looking for. Amen. And the danger with Adventists is that we think that the only thing we need to do is to have the information. But we don't allow ourselves to experience the transformation sure. that that information is intended to produce. And if we make that mistake, then we're not going to be part of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And that's the message of the sanctuary. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. At the bottom line. Thank you, Sister Phyllis, for your encouraging words. Who else would like to make a comment or ask a question? Good evening, Dr. Hannah. Hello, Sister Sue. Yes, we have uh, others on the line who have joined recently and they have not been privileged to get all the different uh, weeks of the sanctuary message. Mm -hmm. uh, in a nutshell, what can you say to give them the essence of the sanctuary message? How to stay connected? How to be converted? Mm -hmm. How to be that advent that Christ is coming back for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, a uh, couple comments, and then I'll answer your question at the end. Uh, in terms of the actual study, uh, as I said, I'm going to share it with, uh, with Owen, and then he can share it with those who would like a copy um, if he has email contacts for you. So, so in terms of the actual information of what we've covered, we want to make it available. S secondly, uh, 
the bottom line, the heart of the sanctuary message is, is there in any text that refers to the sanctuary. We covered many texts in our study, but the bottom line is there in any text concerning the sanctuary. So let's just take one of those texts, the first one we started with, Exodus 25 and verse 8, which says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's the bottom line of the sanctuary message. The sanctuary message is about God wanting to be close to us, God wanting to be near to us, God wanting to dwell with us. And in theory, we all know this is the truth, that that's what God wants. The question is, how do I live as if God is living with me? How do I behave? Uh, how do I plug into this truth that God wants to live with me? You know, uh, that text in Numbers that we shared that where God said to the people, don't defile the land where you dwell because I live there with you too. Well, we all have a theoretical knowledge that God is omnipresent and so he dwells everywhere. But what practical distance, what practical difference does it make that I know theoretically that God is with me right now where I am while I'm speaking? You know, God is with me when I'm in church. God is with me when I'm outside of church. God is with me when I'm at home during the lockdown. God is with me when I go out of my home to work after they open back up the economy. Wherever I go, God is with me. How do I transfer that from just a theoretical understanding to an actually changing of my lifestyle based on that understanding? You know, and what it means practically is that I live through the power of Christ 24 seven, 60 seconds a minute, 60 minutes an hour, 24 hours a day, I live with the consciousness that God is with me because that's, that's what Jesus has made possible because he is Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That's the sanctuary message. In other words, the sanctuary message is the gospel. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, he poured out his Holy Spirit upon us so that we can walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So our challenge as we study the theory of the sanctuary is to live our lives as if we are living in the sanctuary, because we actually are. <laughs> you know, when you're living in your house, you're living in God's sanctuary. When you go to work, you're living in God's sanctuary. When you go to church, you're living in God's sanctuary. But we tend to not know how to make that practical in terms of how we live. And we reduce our understanding of the sanctuary to just saying, well, I am a sharp scholar, so I understand everything Dr. Hanna said. Well, it's not enough to just understand it with your head. It must transform your life. The gospel must be more than theory. It must be transformative theory. So we become new creatures in Christ Jesus. So, so when I preach on the sanctuary, when I teach on the sanctuary, I'm just teaching the gospel in relationship to what the Bible teaches about the sanctuary. It's really not a different subject. It's just another way of teaching the same subject. If any man be in Christ, if any woman be in Christ, if any boy or girl be in Christ, he is a new creature, she is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. Christ is cleansing his sanctuary in me as he cleanses his sanctuary in heaven. And uh, so those are some ways in which I would sum it up, Sister Sue. There's, there's so much more we could say, but uh, the, that's the bottom line. The sanctuary message is the gospel. Yeah, Thank you, Dr. Han. Yeah. The, the, the sanctuary is the place where the, in the Old Testament, the animals were sacrificed to make an atonement for sin. Well, Jesus was sacrificed to be the atoning sacrifice for my sin. So my sins are forgiven. But he also died in order that I might become a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
So I need to allow him to transform my life. I need to surrender to the process of sanctification. And in doing so, I am experiencing the sanctuary message. And if we preach the sanctuary message that way, people would say, oh, I like that sanctuary message. It makes sense. Thank you for sharing it. <laughs> you know, But we get so caught up in all the technical details of information that we forget to drive home the point about transformation, about new creatures in Christ Jesus, which really is the bottom line of the sanctuary message. Thank you, Sister Sue, for that question. Um, Dr. Hannah, now that we have established this spiritual, matter of fact, is there is someone else have a question before I, before, because my question pretty much is going to be um, heading to the final segment here. Is there anyone else that have a question or a statement that you'd like to make at this point? Well, Dr. Hannah, my, you mentioned early on the, the specific date, um, the 2300 years. And mm -hmm. while we have now established the importance, which is the spiritual aspect of it, that God wants to um, be close to us. Heaven is close to us. The sanctuary is a message that's saying God is creator, God is redeemer, God is sustainer, and he's coming king of king and lord of lord in nutshell but can you just spend a few moments just to go back over the the history in terms of the date because they are also significant in terms of where we are in history as a marker as we're looking forward for christ's second come second coming as adventists Yes, I won't go through all of them because that'd take too long, but I'll, I'll give a short introduction to that. Uh, remember that Daniel lived many, uh, many years ago, way back before Christ. Daniel lived in the time of the Babylonian Empire, and he lived in a time when the physical sanctuary of ancient Israel had been defiled. And God gave him good news that the Jews would be allowed to go back to their promised land. They would be able to rebuild their temple and rebuild their city and continue their mission as God's people. And that was fulfilled in 457 BC, which is the first date in the 2300 day prophecy. You see, uh, by the way, my battery is running low. So if I get cut off, you'll know that's what happened. That's fine. Uh, and when that happens, I'll run and get my cord and I'll be back, back on. But you may have to go to the wrap up if I get cut off here. But, um, but so that's the first date, 457 BC. And I'm going to pull up my screen and find that chart while I'm talking. Uh, and then beginning of 457 BC, we have the 2,300 days stretching down to 1844. You see? 1844. So, so we're going to see the chart here in a moment. Here we go. Ah, there we go. So 457 BC is the promise given to Daniel that his people would be freed from Babylonian captivity. They'd go back to their homeland. But then God predicts that there would be a period of probation given to the Jews. And that during the ending years of that period of probation, Jesus would come. And you see the cross of Christ there represented in regard to that but that even after Jesus came and ascended back to heaven, there would be extra time left bringing us down to 1844. And it's during the 1840s that we had this new revival of an awareness of the message of Christ's second coming and the message of the heavenly sanctuary and the message of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And this is where the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been raised up as an institution to proclaim this message. The danger is that we might think but since I'm an Adventist, I'm safe. And since other people are not Adventists, they're in trouble. No, you could be an Adventist and still be in trouble. Because it's not just about which denomination you're in. It's about, are you really converted? Do you really have Jesus in your heart? Have you really been filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you led by the Holy Spirit? Do you understand the spiritual point of the message that God has given 
to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you don't understand that in a deep spiritual way, then it doesn't make any difference whether you're a member of the church or not. So we need to be not only members of the church physically, or in terms of having a baptismal certificate, but we need to be members of the church that Jesus could point to in his judgment from heaven and say, Pastor Owen is one of my children. Dr. Hannah is one of my children. Brother Adam is one of my children. You know, so on and so forth. Sister Phyllis is one of my children. God, we want God to be able to say that about everyone who is on the line today and all our friends and family to whom we preach and share our faith with. We want them to be genuine believers. And this is the message that God has called us to preach in these last days to which we have come at the end of the 2,300 days. So I'll, I'll just leave that there on the screen as a kind of review of that, uh, because if I go into all the details of it, we'll be here for the rest of the night. But that gives you a picture of it. And as I said, I'll share this with you, Pastor Owen, by email, and then uh, others who are interested can contact you to get the details. And of course, we're gonna pick up right from here next week, add some new information and review what we've covered already. Indeed, I, I, I appreciate Dr. Hannah. And thus, this is a great place to end. And so basically, Dr. Hannah, uh, pretty much begin where he have, uh, end where he have begun really this evening presentation. And so, full disclosure, I, as Dr. Anna mentioned, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. And the reason why I am a part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it is because of this prophecy, this specific prophecy that God have called us as children of God to proclaim this unique message. And at the end of the day is center on the Jesus Christ, that Jesus is creator, Jesus is our redeemer, Jesus is our sustainer, and Jesus is coming back as king of king and lord of lord. And so that's the reason why I am an Adventist. And while it is important, as Dr. Anna emphasized, that it's very important for us to know God and God to have a relationship with God, is also equally important, I believe, for also to be a part of God remnant message in our, in, at this time, our God message for this present time, which is the sanctuary message that Jesus Christ wants to cleanse us, and it is a part of the sanctuary message. And so, Dr. Anna, I want to thank you as usual for being here, and I want to thank all of our guests. And in prior, the prior question that was asked, it was asked in respect to um, if someone uh, just came in and you have not get full access to all of these um, series that Dr. Hannah have been sharing with us. I also want you to know that we're going to rebroadcast all of these um, presentations by, uh, by Dr. Hannah and all the others that are presenting here night after night. They're going to be rebroadcast in the process of editing in them and having them on social media. And so in the next week, you could just go to FSM Daily Digital Show. Um, FSM Daily Digital Show may be on Facebook, may be on um, YouTube, um, Instagram, or any uh, of the, the, or rather, all the various social media platform out there, and you will be able to just access these presentations as well. So I just want to let you know that um, they are here to stay. And as Dr. Hannah mentioned, it is part of our responsibility to proclaim this end time message in all the world. And by you being here, you're, you're contributing to this. And one of the, the, the reasons that you can continue to do so is invite others to come and listen on a night to night basis. In fact, it is a part of your moral responsibility to invite others so they can be bring up to speed. They could be taught what God require of us all. And so just wanna, want to share that with us. We are on a mission. We are on a mission. Jesus came and when he finishes his earthly ministry, if you read in Matthew chapter 28, particular verses 16 through 20, 
God says, in summary, that we must teach what he has taught us. We must share what we have learned. God doesn't ask us to do something miraculous. He asks us to share what we have been taught. For example, if you've been taught about this sanctuary message, you now become responsible to share it with someone else. And God will hold us accountable if we don't do so. Because God is on a mission to bring, to, to preach this gospel all over the world. And he has no hand except our hand. He has no feet except our feet. We are the extension of God. We are the ex God extended. So God wants to use us to proclaim the gospel in all the world. So again, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank Dr. Anna. At this time, we're going to transition into our final segment of this program, where we pray for all the leaders of the world. We pray for those that are on the front line, uh, fighting and do all that they can, even risk their life for our own safety. We also want to pray for your family and my family. We want to pray that God will continue to use us. Well, without any further ado, Sister Mortley, if you could share with us a, a special selection at this point, please. Come, let us worship the true and living Savior. Let us lift holy hands to our God, for he Heavenly Father and our God. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 in particular, and 7, the Bible has made clear our calling us back to worship you that you are indeed the creator of us all and the creator of this universe. So as such, O oh God, we come, as uh, Sister Mortley of this song, to worship you. Because we have concluded 
in our mind that you are worthy to be praised. So as such, Father, we come to give you praises and worship because you're worthy. Now, Father, if there's any thought that we have that is unlike you, anything that we have said or omitted to say, anything that we have done, which will separate us from you, Father, we ask you forgiveness even now because we want nothing to stand between us worshiping you because you're worthy. You're worthy, O oh God, because you're our creator. You're worthy, O oh God, because you are our redeemer. You're worthy, O oh God, because you sustain us and give us life even now. You provide for us. You are worthy, O oh God, and we look forward for the time when you shall come when the sky will roll back like a scroll and you will come to take us to live with you. Father, we also come and lay all of our burdens at the foot of the cross because you ask us in fact to do so. So Father, I wanna praise you now because you have been answering our prayer as Pastor Howell have just got the news that the hospital are where they're giving care to his mom, have called that it's now time for her to come home. Lord, this is a blessing. And we want to thank you for this. Because clearly, you have answered our prayer, even online and this ministry even now. Okay? On this very platform, we have prayed for her. So you have answered our prayer. But Lord, also, Dr. Payne have gave a report that there are 25 nations that have just declared that they are no longer have any person that has the COVID-19 or this virus. Lord, we want to praise you for this because we pray that it will be so and you have answered in our prayer. And even as we listen to the governor of New York, he have made it clear that they have now reached a point that they start to stem this virus and they're seeing progress. Father, you have been answering our prayer, and we just want to thank you. Lord, we continue to pray for all our leaders of the world, because this is your world. We continue to pray for all of us and this platform and our individual families. Lord, I pray that you will help us to continue to proclaim this message to all this world, so you shall come. Help us to do this faithfully. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Dr. Anna, on behalf of all of us here and those that will join us shortly on the platform, various platform, uh, social media platform, we want to say thank you. You're welcome. And, and, and indeed, again, thank you. Thank you. And for, for our audience, we want to thank you. Without you, this will not be possible. We want to thank you for your faithfulness. We want to thank you for your support, both financially and your presence. And so without you, this ministry will not be possible. This is our way of expanding the kingdom of God. This is Amen. our way of sharing this gospel with this, entire, uh, with this entire world. And by supporting, by being here, you are a part of it. It is not just myself or Dr. Hunter, you are a part of it. So I just want to thank you and, and may God continue to bless you and your family. We're looking forward for that day when Christ shall come, when sin itself will die. And we are just the way we pray for Pastor Howell and pray for others and God has answered our prayer. Likewise, a time will come when we'll be in heaven with God. And so we just want to thank you for what you've been doing. Dr. Hunter, again, and be off of us. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night. All right. I'm looking Thank forward you, to having you. Night, night. Thank you, Dr. Anna. We appreciate you. May God continue to bless you. Thank you. I've learned so much. It's so much. Thank you again. Praise the Lord. See you next week. Go See you next have week. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye, y'all. God bless. Good night, everybody. Blessings. Blessings.